Good morning, everyone. Um, I hope you can hear me, and then welcome to our second panel of uh, IoT Live. The topic of this panel is around open source software. I'm Ian Skerritt from, from the Eclipse Foundation, and I've been um, involved with our Eclipse IoT community for, for building open source software, and we have a great uh, lineup of panels today. Um, and so I what I would like to encourage everyone to do is use the Q&A uh, section to ask questions throughout, and we'll get to the questions at, at the end. And so we have three panelists. They will go through and do about a 10, 15 minute presentation about their specific topic, and then we'll, we'll get to questions. So um, first up is uh, Benjamin Cabe, who will actually do an introduction to the, the Eclipse IoT community. Benjamin. Hey, good morning, good afternoon. Uh, so yep, I will start sharing my screen right now. So yeah, in 15 minutes, <clears throat> I would like to um, to walk you through some of the stuff that's uh, being uh, developed in open source for for doing IoT. So it's only 15 minutes, so it's going to be focusing mostly on uh, technology that's being developed um, in at the Eclipse Foundation, and the idea is to get you um, up to speed about what we do, why we do this, and what we do. At, uh, at the Eclipse Foundation around open source. So um, it's not going to be new, and I'm going to be uh, pretty quick on that. Uh, the IoT market is pretty fragmented. Lots of um, lots of different hardware solutions, lots of different protocols around, lots of different technologies, uh, making it very difficult to have interoperable solutions. Um, a strong, uh, yeah, a strong lock-in. Basically, you get a home automation solution from vendor A, and it's very unlikely that it's going to be interoperable um, with um, a solution from from vendor B, even if uh, some companies are are getting better at it. And um, yeah, all in all, it it, uh, it makes it very very complex to to build solutions. People need to reinvent the wheel uh, when they need to to build a solution. So. Yeah, um, the panel before, which was actually a pretty great panel, and uh, talked about um, uh, what open hardware can do to help um, help people prototype faster, help people uh, have access to um, to easier way to manufacture their their products. Well, the idea with uh, with open source is is basically the same. And um, what uh, what I would like to talk about today is um, an initiative that's been started at the Eclipse Foundation uh, two years, three years ago, um, approximately. The, um, the Eclipse Foundation is basically an open source foundation, just like Apache or Linux. And uh, we are home for a community of, of open source projects uh, in, in, in very different um, areas and, and and more particularly since two or three years ago, as I said, around IoT. The idea is really to provide, just like, uh, again, earlier, um, we, we talked about uh, Arduinos, Raspberry Pis, and then microcontrollers are uh, as building blocks for, for hardware solutions. And the idea is to have the same for, um, for, for the software, for the software that runs on, on such platforms. And what do you need? Well. If you want to build an, an IoT solution that is interoperable, um, that is um, something that people will be able to to extend and to modify, then the protocols that you use need to be need to be open. So, uh, um, a few more words about this in in a few slides. But yeah, we have protocols like MQTT or Co-op uh, that are very popular in IoT. And these protocols have open source implementations that are available as part of the, the, the portfolio, I would say, of, of project that we have uh, at the Eclipse IoT, um, in the Eclipse IoT community. Uh, when you develop a solution, uh, well, you need, just like, again, with your Arduino, uh, you need some, some tools, some, uh, um, yeah, some tools to do the, the actual hardware design. Well, when it comes to developing a software solution, then you need um, you need an IDE, a development environment, uh, to, to to write your code. And the code that you will write, it's very likely going to use some kind of framework. Uh, you need some um, helpers to um, to access your underlying hardware, to manipulate your GPS stack and the like. So yeah, we also have frameworks and tools as part of the Eclipse IoT initiative. And um, uh, what you need also uh, on top of, uh, of the protocols, the frameworks, and the tools is something that I would call services or actually 
um, vert vertical kind of solutions um, with all these building blocks we actually start having a more um, a vertical solutions like home automation solutions and um, yeah we have open source projects around that as well so um, what can you build uh, using uh, open source building blocks and in particular um, the building blocks that we have at Eclipse well some of the, um, the, the projects I'm going to talk about you may have heard about them already. If not, uh, go check them out. So, uh, what um, what can you do if you want to build your own open um, open sensor network? If you want to have your own um, cloud-based or um, uh, host your own um, uh, solution for for having sensors uh, communicating with each other, then uh, you might want to check out the Eclipse PAHO project. Uh, PAHO is really about providing open source implementations of the MQTT protocol. Um, so in, in panel number three, in the next uh, the next panel, we're going to have uh, actually an in-depth presentation of MQTT. The idea with MQTT is to have a, a protocol for the Internet of Things, something that's very lightweight that allows um, sensors to communicate with each other and the way they communicate with each other is by using a central broker they use some kind of publish subscribe mechanism uh, and so in order to have your own broker you can rely on Eclipse Mosquito uh, which is an open source implementation of an MQTT server basically so uh, based on, uh, on, on PAHO and Mosquito you can start building your sensor network and um, and PAHO comes with implementations for lots of different programming languages so it's even uh, simpler to run uh, I mean if you want to run PAHO on microcontrollers using a C flavor of uh, MQTT you can do that if you have more processing power you might want to use Python etc etc um, another option uh, this is why I mean this is an alternative uh, topology for a sensor network um, and something that's very uh, often uh, seen in the field is you have several networks that you need to breach like uh, networks that talk using um, MQTT some other that would talk maybe using the co-op protocol so again uh, co-op uh, we're gonna have a presentation about co-op in the next um, in the next panel um, and uh, yeah uh, thanks to um, to California uh, you can have um, implementations of the co-op protocol for your sensors and your devices and thanks to Eclipse Ponte you can actually start building bridges uh, between uh, between sensor networks and QTT to rest and the other way around the co-op to uh, HTTP rest and the other way around etc etc so that's uh, also uh, an open source technology that's available at Eclipse Another um, something that we always, uh, well, at least that we often um, forget when it comes to building IoT solutions is, uh, well, you want to do home automation and you want to have your uh, smart uh, thermostat and you want to be able to monitor the temperature in your house and stuff. Fair enough. Uh, well, you can use MQTT co-op to do that. Um, but at some point, your device is on the field. You need also to manage them for what they are, uh, devices. You need to be able to upgrade their uh, firmware or software over the air. You might want to monitor the signal strength of your uh, cellular modem. Uh, so you need to do what's called device management. And um, the good thing is that there are standards that are being developed around device management. Uh, you may have heard about uh, Lightweight M2M from the Open, Open Mobile Alliance. Um, if not, go check it out. It's a, it's a standard for, for device management that uh, that on top of co-op implements uh, workflows for doing uh, yeah, just as the, the drawing um, shows for doing um, management like um, uh, monitoring the battery level of the, of the device uh, changing settings over the air and up upgrading software etc so you can use um, Eclipse Wakaama uh, for, for for doing for doing this and uh, there is also an open source lightweight M2M server that's available on GitHub it's called Leshen um, and, and and by the way um, yeah Wakaama is the, the source code is uh, is on is on GitHub for now and it's still in the process of being contributed to Eclipse um, yeah, as I said earlier, um, protocols, tools, frameworks, but also more vertical kind of solutions. And um, we have a very cool project that is called Eclipse Smart Home, 
uh, if you're familiar with home automation, you may have heard about the Open Hub project. Uh, it's basically Open Hub uh, moving to um, the Open Hub framework that moves to, to Eclipse. And with uh, the Eclipse Smart Home project, you have a framework for running on your gateway, on your Raspberry Pi, or on your um, yeah, on a box in your in your house, and you can start having different bindings to um, to your um, light bulbs, to your alarm system, using several. I mean, using lots of protocols. Uh, Smart Home comes with implementation for uh, X10, um, PLC, um, Bluetooth uh, sensors, uh, Philips Hue, etc. So it's all based on a configuration kind of. Um, a workflow where you declare all your sensors and, and how you want them to talk with each other. And uh, there's also MQTT support in smart home. So if you want to bridge your um, your light bulb and stuff like that uh, with um, with MQTT, uh, you, you can have your smart home instance talk to to an MQTT broker. So that's uh, that's pretty pretty interesting. Yeah, what uh, a quick um, thing I wanted to highlight. Uh, and this is one of the reasons I think it's important to, to develop uh, these open source projects at Eclipse is that um, there's no single solution for, uh, there's no, there's, there won't be one, just like there won't be one protocol for IoT, there, will, there won't be one programming language for, for IoT either. So um, the, um, the cool thing with what we have at, uh, at Eclipse in terms of, uh, of uh, frameworks for embedded systems, for example, is that we can uh, go all the way from uh, constrained, very constrained microcontrollers like Arduino and run a very small MQTT stack on the Arduino uh, to uh, something that's more powerful like um, a, a Raspberry Pi and something with lots of memory that can run a Java virtual machine and in which you can install a framework like Eclipse Cura uh, that Marco is going to talk about uh, just after me. Um, and yeah, you have basically, depending on whether you are more on the uh, coding side of things, when you will, where you will actually write your own um, uh, MQTT client and, and do all the code yourself, uh, or uh, use more uh, more power, powerful framework where you more configuring your gateway slash slash device to do um, to communicate back and forth with um, uh, with a server or with other sensors, uh, and same on the server side. If you are really building the infrastructure of your sensor network, uh, then um, yeah, you will likely use something like Mosquito, um, and maybe you want to do something more about bridging some sensors with with each other, and you are more in the integration kind of uh, kind of stuff. So uh, Ponte can be useful there, and uh, and really, if you want to do uh, more application enablement kind of stuff, then. Uh, yeah, we have frameworks for uh, for implementing the ETC M2M standard, for example, and you can start um, bridging with uh, other uh, BI solutions like BERT, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, um, yeah, why why is it important uh, to have open source technology, and well, in particular, what we have at Eclipse? Well, we cover, we try to cover and to have a, a portfolio of technologies that go all the way, as I said, from the very tiny constrained devices to um, more, more powerful uh, uh, gateways like uh, 3G, 4G routers. Uh, we have technologies that cover um, pretty much the whole IoT uh, chain from embedded um, communication to, uh, to what you need to put on the, on the server side. To do, uh, um, yeah, to actually actually uh, acquire the data and do some BI, as I said, and I think Marco is going to cover that that topic in just a few minutes. And yeah, there's just no other solution when you think about it. Uh, if the IoT is not open, we will have a, uh, a problem, right? Think of uh, the Snowden uh, um, uh, affair, for example. So. Uh, in order to get developers' engagement and to, to really drive IoT um, innovation, uh, there will there's just no other choice than than having uh, open source technologies. Um, if you want more, if you want to learn more, go check out our portal iot.eclipse.org. I'm Card Ben on Twitter. Uh, this is my email address, and I'm sure we will talk more. And I will answer uh, hopefully uh, the, your questions at the end of the. Um, Yep, at uh, the quarter past the hour, I think we will start discussing with Ian. Yep, um, and that's for that's it for me. Fifteen minutes. That's great. Great, thank thank you, Benjamin. Um, 
Just thank you for the introduction to Eclipse IoT. And um, so ne next up, we have um, Marco Kara from Eurotech, um, who is also the project leader for for one of the Eclipse projects called Cura, which is a uh, which um, Marco is going to introduce um, and and kind of t talk a bit about how it's used in in, in the real world. So Marco, um, can if you want to unmute yourself um, and then share your screen, that would be great. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. So let me start uh, on my screen share. Hopefully you guys can see my screen now. So 15 minutes uh, after Benjamin's introduction, uh, what I'm going to be talking about today is about Eclipse IoT technology in action. So, so Benjamin described the great portfolio of projects and products that Eclipse uh, uh, IoT Industry Working Group has collected under its own umbrella. What we have done between Eurotech, the company I'm working for, and Actuate uh, uh, for the EclipseCon conference is try to put an end-to-end -end solution uses these as building blocks to accelerate and bootstrap your IT project. Just as Benjamin described, um, an IoT system can actually be decomposed in different parts, uh, parts that are more related towards the field to actually integrate and collect the sensor data or remotely connect and control actuators. Uh, those are generally run on edge gateways and edge computing platform, the Raspberry Pi being a great example of how open hardware is accelerating in that direction. And they do need frameworks running on the edge of your IoT and M2M system to actually do the data collection and the remote management. Then you have a transport part, and Benjamin has also touched upon that about MQTT and co-op and other protocols. Uh, transport of M2M and IoT data does require special needs protocols because it often happens on links like cellular and satellites, which are expensive, secure sensitive, and they need to be efficient and reliable. Once the data is inside your enterprise boundaries, being that on enterprise servers, private cloud, or public cloud, um, you want to run business intelligence and data analytics on that to actually extract the business value to extract those business in insights that can lead to better optimizations or explore new market and uh, opportunities and strategies. Now, there are a lot of good tools there, uh, including open source one, just like the Eclipse BERT, who are the partners into these demos that we had put together. And then once you start having more than a few of these devices upload, uh, deployed out there on the fields, you do need ways of managing them. Um, we do have MKTT as a protocol to be able to manage devices. Others are emerging, just as Benjamin has described. Out of these four phases, we picked and choose a few technologies available in the Eclipse IoT portfolio today. Uh, the Eclipse Cura framework contributed to Eclipse by Eurotech, a Java OSGI framework that leverages the portability and flexibility of Java and the modularity of OSGI and complements them with a set of bundles that helps you the ease of development and deployment of M2M applications running on gateways. We made the choice of MQTT as a transport protocol, therefore leverage the Eclipse PAO library in the specific Java version integrated in CUDA and the Mosquito Broker to establish the communications between the devices and the center broker. And through our partners here, we did use Eclipse BERT to actually divide, deploy and integrate data intelligence and analytics. The management was done, as I said, through MQTT and some of the bundles facilities that um, CURA offers to be able to do SGI um, service management remotely through the MQTT protocol. All these pieces were put together um, for the EclipseCon conference a month ago, uh, trying to use, we, out of the many IoT verticals, we actually use the people counting, so monitoring people traffic in certain areas as one of the use cases that we actually wanted to highlight and showcase in the concepts of this conference. We actually used several sensors that were monitoring some of the key areas of the showroom floor, uh, especially the entrances into the Grand uh, Peninsula ballroom, monitoring the entrance and the exit. That gives us a good estimate of the amount of people that were in the room. And we're trying to correlate the density of the people in that area with environmental sensors so that were actually, or the readings of the environmental sensor that were actually placed inside the room itself. And these are a few pictures of the deployments. So you can see we had this uh, people counting sensor you see in the bottom left installed on tension rods in the opening of each of the different areas while the uh, sensor itself was deployed inside the main room where we were having the biggest sessions and the big keynotes. And we had some dashboard at the entrances of this area that were showing the correlations. So in the next of the presentation, I'll walk you through 
how this was all put together, a little bit on the hardware side just to give you a glimpse of that and a little bit more in depth on the software side, how all these building blocks that the Eclipse portfolio offers can actually already be uh, composed into like a production quality IoT solution. So let's start from the architecture slide. So typical parts of an IoT system, uh, the device and the gateway is running on the edge. Uh, in this case, we were using the Raspberry Pi as a gateway uh, using its uh, uh, default Linux distribution. And as I said, in this case, the choice for an edge uh, uh, computing framework uh, for, uh, fell on uh, Java OSGI and the Eclipse CUDA framework, mostly because of the flexibility and the modularization and the ready to use uh, uh, bundles that are available in the stack that also led to a faster time to the market. We were able to assemble the solution in, in a couple of weeks altogether. The Raspberry Pi was also acting as a gateway towards the sensors, the people counter, and the environmental monitoring sensors, which we will describe briefly in the next slide. Transport was happening towards MQTT. Uh, we actually used, in this case, a commercial product, the Eurotech uh, Everywhere Cloud, as a first data collector, but the same data could actually be fed directly into uh, the business analytics uh, if uh, more real-time or additional aggregation and caches were uh, available downstream into the data flow. Then once the data, the raw data, the, as is normally referred to, the raw data that was extracted for the sensor was made available to the business intelligence. They were actually running their own business intelligence and analytics and composed them into different aggregators uh, by time period and different correlations uh, that we'll see in a bit. So let's walk through this slide uh, from the left to the right and go a little bit more in depth into each of the different pieces. But Marco, okay. Marco, yes. sorry yep. to interrupt. I, I think you need to reshare your, your, your desktop. It seems the it's been stuck on, yeah, okay, there. Okay, uh, a quick introduction on the sensors. So um, uh, we used two commercial sensors from Eurotech uh, for the people counter. The, uh, it's a sensor described, uh, depicted on the left side of the slide here. It's using computer vision technology to build like a 3D uh, field of view, cone-shaped field of view. Through blood motion tracking, 3D is actually able to track people that are crossing a threshold uh, bidirectionally, essentially entering or exiting uh, the room. What the technology itself was is interesting about these devices, applications. We're using them in large airports, in trams, trains, and buses, or so mobile vehicles. Uh, and more creative application, like, for example, at the large airport, we have a pilot that uh, the cleaning company of public toilets is actually using these devices to rearrange and optimize their cleaning schedule, not just based on fixed time interval, but actually based on usage. So. Uh, you know, sometimes when this technology and the barrier of entry of this technology is low, just creativity is, is the limit here. And then inside the room, we used a more traditional environmental monitoring station, measuring air pollutants and some other air quality like electromagnetic radiations and radioactivity and so on. The sensor data is then collected in the Raspberry Pi through the Eclipse CUDA framework. This is more of a functional breakdown of all the modules that are available in Eclipse. They're all in the form of OSGI bundles. As mentioned by Benjamin in his talk, they actually address things like uh, simplifying the acquisition of the data from sensors and devices to the um, transmission of the data towards the cloud or the receiving of the commands toward the cloud through data services, buffering of data and the remote and configuration management. In this case, two simple applications in the form of SCI bundles were developed for this demo that were periodically pulling the different sensors and sending them up to the remote servers, as well as receiving calibrations of values for the environmental sensors or reset commands for the people counters at the end of the day. So showing also how active management of the device can, can be available through these type of frameworks. So we discussed about the transport. We said we, we used MQTT. Uh, there are many good sessions in the rest of the day about MQTT that I encourage you to follow if you have a chance. As we said, it's a publish and subscribe top, uh, protocol. The data is actually addressed to a topic, which is hierarchical namespace. Uh, what we show here in this slide is how we organize the data model for this uh, specific demo. So what topic namespace will be, be used. In this case, as you can see, the topic was carrying a semantic value of the location where the installation was. We had the EclipseCon, Hyatt, and Ballroom, and then three different locations, in this case, mapping to the three different gateways. One door set, the second door set, and the sensors inside. 
and you will see below the different counts, uh, sorry, the different metrics that we were sending at each of these different topics, and specifically the in and out count for each of the doors at each openings, and uh, environmental sensors data. The data was sent up into the cloud and then made available to business intelligence. In this case, our partners were the Actuate guys, the guys behind BERT, the Business Intelligence and Reporting Tools project, which is a top-level project at Eclipse, actually fairly mature at this point, um, is, as they like to qualify, the professional open source, and it comes from contributions from IBM Innovent Solutions, and at this point it has a very large community of people behind them. What um, BERT does, as most generic business intelligence tools, can be decomposed into a designer phase where you actually model your data sources and you leverage tools like the Eclipse integration itself to actually design your reports. And then your report definition is combined with the data that you collect. In this case, would be machine data that you collect from the field uh, by the BERT engine, which actually gener generate your report instances, as in the form of email, PDF, or as in this case, um, auto-refreshable HTML pages that show and coordinate some of the data that, that we were showing. The interesting part here is that uh, while these tools have been around for decades at this point, in terms of business intelligence and business analytics, most of the data sources that we're focusing on were coming from traditional, already digital data, if you will, like typical CRM, web blogs, social media, it's maybe in the next wave, um, now a little bit of big data. What we showed in this demo is that even within the portfolio of the Eclipse ecosystem, it's very easy now to use building blocks able to actually get physical data or machine data that you collect from real sensors and feed them into typical IT data flows, and therefore including business intelligence and data analytics tools. So BERT in this case was actually correlating sensors data and people data, and one thing that we wanted to do we didn't get a chance to do was make, for example, social media data, all coming as different data feeds that can be meshed together um, into actionable dashboard and uh, to explore and expose uh, new data insights. So let's actually take a look at the dashboard itself and how it came out. So this was the dashboard that we were showing at the entrances at the, at the showroom floor. You can see it had the real-time reading around the environmental sensors and the current populations inside the room. And then using the capability of data analytics and business intelligence, it was actually showing the different historical trends over the course of the conference. So this screenshot was actually taken maybe halfway through the conference. In the graphs here below, we will actually see the gray bars that are actually the people in the room and then all the different lines where the different environmental sensors. Uh, certain patterns we expected to see, others were actually quite interesting. If we take a look, for example, at the electromagnetic interference, we actually see a very sharp spike um, around the morning on the 18th, around 8.39 a.m., and that actually happened to be the time of the Mike Milinkovic keynotes, where all the people were actually assembling into the main keynote room and turning on their Wi-Fi and cellulars to actually take pictures and tweets about the keynotes, and you can actually see the, the big spikes into electromagnetic interference here. This was maybe one of the expected. One of the less expected was maybe at midnight on the, after the end of the first day and beginning on the second day of the conference, we actually saw a big spike in the particular matter. These are basically um, granules, uh, uh, air uh, pollutants that you can see. And uh, we actually went back, tried to see what was the origin of that. Definitely we didn't have cars in the room, but uh, that was actually the time where a cleaning crew came in and used big vacuum cleaner to actually uh, vacuum all the carpet, and that definitely like raised a lot of, um, of dirt into the air, and it was actually picked up by this. So that actually is uh, a, a good, interesting uh, show and application, a use case of how you can actually combine all these technology into an end-to-end -end solution today, uh, deploy them in production, and definitely accelerate and bootstrap your, your IoT projects. All right. Th thank you, Marco. Um... Very much appreciate it. So, um, and um, just uh, just looking at the, the there's some of the questions in in the the Q and A section. Um, so we will definitely try and get uh, the slides um, uploaded. Just so you know, everyone knows, these are being recorded and will be available for playback uh, um, when we're finished at the end end of the day. So, um, but we will try and get the slides done. And I apologize about the technical problems um, to 
to um, where the slides got stuck, but I think we got, got it fixed. So, so next up, uh, the last of our panelists is Emmanuel Basili from, from Enria, who's um, one of the, the project leaders for an operating system for IoT called Riot, Riot OS. And um, so I'm very much looking forward to, to um, Emmanuel's uh, presentation. So Emmanuel, if you can uh, share your, your desktop and take yourself off mute. Okay. Uh, okay, so I'm Emmanuel Bacelli. I work for INRIA and Freie Universität Berlin, and I'm going to talk to you about a operating system for the IoT called Riot. So uh, the big picture that we're all uh, uh, talking about today is uh, this giant collision between uh, a few phenomena that uh, are a few years old. So uh, the internet, uh, wireless communication on the other side, and uh, more recently, um, the avalanche of cheap, tiny hardware. Um, and this uh, collision uh, between these three phenomena is uh, um, uh, creating this Internet of Things that we're all interested in. Uh, so first, I'll talk about our, our, our vision of uh, the IoT, what we think it's going to look like, and, and how, what's the impact going to be of the IoT. And then uh, we'll talk about uh, what we think uh, the current status of the IoT is and various aspects of it. And then we'll focus on uh, what we think is needed for an operating system for IoT devices. And I'll talk uh, more precisely about Riot. So uh, what we think the IoT is really going to bring is a new world of interconnected hardware. So uh, in particular, a uh, much denser environment of communicating devices. And um, these devices will be much more heterogeneous than they used to be, um, especially in terms of memory and CPU. The communications uh, that they will use will use much more low power and multi types of radio than they used in the past. Another aspect is that um, at the application layer will have um, thousands of new applications that will pop up that will personalize our environment um, and do that automatically. And this is going to change our world. And the way these applications are going to work is they're going to leverage both interaction with uh, um, uh, cloud system as we, as we know it today, but also um, more spontaneous wireless networks like ad hoc networks. And the mix between these, uh, these uh, different uh, network paradigms are going to create um, uh, quite some new interesting uh, things in terms of user experience, for example. Uh, so this is, uh, you know, uh, a way to see it is that it's going to be creating a, a new, the internet actually taking shape. I mean, uh, up until now, the internet was really uh, through a screen um, of various shapes, but uh, what the IoT means for us is that our interface to the internet will, might no longer be pre predominantly a screen or or keyboard or mouse, but actually the objects, these these new uh, devices that will be connected to the internet that we can interact with physically. So let's just talk about like what 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 the IoT, where we are at with the IoT. Um, um, so I'll, we'll just give our perspective here, and maybe we can open this for discussion later on. Uh, but from the hardware perspective, uh, the IoT is already here. I mean. Um, uh, Dozens of tiny uh, devices that are really exciting and pretty cheap uh, pop up very every day. Uh, so everybody knows about the Arduino uh, Uno. Uh, there are other boards from Arduino that are very exciting. Uh, uh, these, these watches uh, that predate uh, all the fuss about uh, smart watches um, uh, and other boards um, that use various uh, architectures in terms of uh, microcontrollers or processors from 8 bits to 16 bits or, or 32 bits and various uh, radios uh, from sub gigahertz to um, to uh, 2 .4 gigahertz um, like like Wi-Fi that range. Uh, you have also more exotic stuff that's pop that's coming um, uh, in in the future uh, and so. Here we already see uh, that we have to deal with quite heterogeneous environments. And ideally, what we would like uh, from the software perspective is to uh, be able to build upon um, uh, tools that are known by everybody, uh, by um, uh, such as uh, ideally we would like uh, a Linux or, or a BSD uh, to uh, operate these devices. Okay, but the the problem is that. Um, the typical uh, constraints that you have on, on these devices 
uh, forbid the use of Linux. Uh, so typically, you're not going to be able to run Linux with um, you know a few uh, kilobits of RAM or a few tens of kilobits of RAM. Same thing with CPU. Uh, if it's really too weak, which is um, you know uh, often the case with the devices, um, you're not going to be able to uh, enjoy Linux that much. And um, one thing you might say is like, okay. Uh, you know, let's wait until uh, these devices become more powerful. Uh, Moore's law is going to apply, and blah blah blah. You know, uh, we 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 just wait for Linux to be able to run on these machines. But um, if you look at um, you know the evolution of the last ten years and uh, the actual deployment scenarios uh, and the business environments for the types of deployments uh, where every sense counts. Uh, these constraint devices will probably remain constrained. So it's it's uh, it's uh, it's pr it's relevant to uh, focus on these constraints. And then, in practice, uh, since uh, uh, Linux cannot be used, um, uh, most of the uh, devices that are deployed now do not use a real OS, but uh, um, are actually managed by a proprietary and hard, somewhat hardware-specific and somewhat primitive software platforms. And that's that's the reality today. So uh, what our point is here is that um, uh, there will no there will be no uh, IoT until uh, uh, some some software big bang happens. And what by big bang we mean something like what happened for mobile phones since 2007, where a couple of uh, very dominant players came around and um, um, became uh, uh, the the main the main platforms um, upon which. Uh, third-party developers could develop their applications, and uh, this has fueled a quite uh, a development very fast and, uh, of, of these devices and has completely reshaped the, the, the market on, on mobile phones. So and, and this is what we think has, what has really changed the, the, the mobile phone uh, industry. It's not really the hardware, but more and more the software, even though the hardware has progressed, of course. But we, we, we basically need something like that for the IoT. Uh, we need a, a couple of, of, of de facto standards in terms of operating system that will provide the consistent API and, 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 and SDK cross hardware platform, OK? And um, that's, that's what we've been focusing on at Riot. So then, if we talk about such an operating system, what what's what we want to have? Um, you know, so in terms of programming model for the IoT, there's there's no real uh, dominant programming model. Uh, it was already highlighted by some previous talks. So essentially, um, it, the way we see things, there are a couple of choices out there. Um, there are event-driven uh, operating systems uh, that were developed for the sensor networks um, a few years ago that use uh, some non-standard programming language, such as uh, so Contiki or TinyOS. And you have uh, another approach, which provides uh, multi-threading, full multi-threading, uh, based on microkernels, such as uh, Riot of FreeRTOS. And uh, what we can use as a reference, uh, maybe, is um, if we want to connect to the rest of the internet, we can look at what they do there. And the rest of the internet has basically a common programming model that is based on multi-threading and, and POSIX API and standard programming languages. So uh, maybe it's a good idea to try to stick to that if it's possible. Uh, on, in terms of network stack, uh, again, there's no dominant uh, network stack for the IoT. We've, we've, we've seen this uh, also in previous uh, talks. Uh, there are a couple of approaches out there. So vertical silos, such as ZigBee or or IC100, and a more layered stack approach based on IP with uh, six low pan, um, uh, UDP, and co-app, um, as I was mentioned also in a previous talk. And there, again, uh, if we look at uh, the internet, the dominant, uh, net the rest of the internet has a dominant network stack that is based on, on layering uh, protocols and, and IP protocols. So if we... Uh, if, if, if our, our goal is to actually bridge the gap between uh, the IoT, IoT devices, and Internet as we know it. And uh, we see that, um, uh, you know, uh, Linux is gonna, not going to make it. Um, operating systems that were um, designed uh, a decade ago for sensor networks do not have all uh, the um, uh, properties that we want. And so uh, we, we were... You know, in our opinion, we were a little bit stuck, and so that's why we uh, start uh, our efforts on Riot. And what we uh, have achieved is um, that you know we could answer this question. You know, like uh, 
the first things that people were saying uh, a few years ago about um, you know uh, sticking a uh, uh, the, the internet's dominant programming model and IP network stack on small IoT devices, it was thought impossible. So this uh, actually we proved the contrary that it's it's possible with with Riot uh, provides this thing and and then on top of that, uh, of course, people will say, okay, okay, you can do that, but um, surely you can't have real time properties and energy efficiency on top of these things. And well, basically, um, we 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 achieved that in Riot too. So you both you're you're bridging the gap with uh, the the traditional way you program uh, on the internet, and you add uh, important capabilities uh, that are uh, essential for IoT um, IoT applications, such as real real time and and energy efficiency. So the way we do this uh, is uh, based on the microkernel architecture. Uh, which enables you to have a very modular structure that adapts on to various requirements in terms of okay uh, board um, capabilities in terms of memory, for example, or in CPU. Uh, we have a, a, a scheduler which is somewhat innovative. Uh, it's stickless, so it doesn't need to wake up periodically. So we 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 save some energy, and we have a very uh, deterministic uh, kernel kind of behavior that enables real-time capabilities. Um, we've also spent quite some time um, uh, focusing on um, and diminishing the uh, latency for uh, interpenning, which is also very important for for the real time capabilities. And uh, on top of this uh, kernel, we have uh, developed uh, a few, uh, three network stacks actually currently. Uh, actually, there is a fourth that's not uh, uh, shown here. Uh, so a traditional uh, six low band based um, uh, network stack uh, which has a uh, co-op sitting on top uh, for example and uh, there's also a traditional IP stack uh, that was developed so with uh, instead of co-op for example this uh, um, uh, HTTP uh, and TCP and UDP and and, uh, uh, and the usual protocols that you would, you would check and recently we've added to that uh, a CCN uh, network stack best based on a, a light version of CCNX and there's also this open WSN uh, network stack that has been um, ported um, recently. And the main message here is that, you know, with Riot, you can, uh, that was our main goal, you can, as a developer, the stuff that was uh, coded for Linux very easily. So basically, you're going to uh, code to an API that is uh, like you know it. So, uh, you know, POSIX um, sockets are like you're used to. Uh, you can develop your application in uh, NCC or C++ like you're used to on Linux. And uh, the thing you get is that uh, if you develop once, then you can run everywhere uh, on all the, the devices that are supported by Riot, so from 16-bit platforms to 32-bit platforms. Yeah, and to that, again, what you gain from this, very, this closeness to Linux is that uh, you benefit from very advanced de debugging, I mean, advanced in the sense that it's not hard as you expect in the IoT. Uh, debugging in the IoT was uh, very um, difficult, uh, as as we all know, up until now. Uh, and uh, so you can use uh, all the tools you're used to in, in Linux, so GDB, Valgrin, Wireshark, Profiler, and you can even emulate Riot and run it as a as a Linux process on your Linux machine. So um, even without specialized hardware, you can already start to work on on, on your code, and you can also uh, we provided also tools um, to test networks, so toy networks on your on your Linux machine, where you can emulate uh, um, several uh, Riot instances that talk to each other, and you can test your you know, distributed application uh, with that, and you can visualize your network. And last but not least, uh, we uh, we support also open test beds. So there are various open test beds that you can um, access through the through portals on on the internet and uh, basically flash your uh, firmware and and then just uh, monitor what's going on and test test your, your applications, your distributed application. And that's very useful. So you have the whole panel of emulator, uh, emulation and, and uh, real experiments. Okay, so that's my last slide. And um, we are uh, an open source community also, so um, uh, we are welcome everyone who wants to participate or use the code. So um, we're based on GitHub, and there are quite a number of forks. 
a big um, a growing community of developers, so it's a young community. Um, but please join and ask your question on, on the mailing list uh, or, or join us on the web. And that's about what I would say. Thanks. Uh, excellent. Like Thank you. Um, <laughs> yeah, um, so why don't we um, ask uh, Benjamin and Marco to, to come in, and um, we'll, we'll start a, a Q&A. So I encourage anyone to, if you have a question, feel free to ask it um, in, in the Q&A section. Um, and the first question that came in was actually to you, Emmanuel. Um, and so, are you facing any IP issues um, when it comes to interface and porting Riot OS to any hardware that might not be actually that open? Uh, yeah, so so there are a couple of uh, licenses that are a little bit weird that we come up with, uh, come stumble upon. Um, so um, there were some some yeah some exotic licenses uh, sometimes that we have to. Uh, we have to contact the guys and ask them like, hey, um, you know. Um, so yeah, this is this is like uh, this is um, this is a, a a problem that we have to that we have to deal with. Yes. Okay, I guess in general too, um, and I open up this to uh, Marco and Benjamin too, and, and you, Manuel. What what are some of the inhibitors you see just in terms of open source software in in IoT? Well, maybe I I, I can start. Um, and it's uh, something we've seen maybe earlier with the open hardware panel. Um, until very recently, uh, it was difficult to actually have open source software for IoT because we didn't have hardware for IoT. Uh, when you need to buy a $1,000 board for uh, for doing your uh, and running your IoT project and and um, and do your your prototyping and stuff, uh, it's uh, it's actually pretty difficult. Well, now good thing that we have the Raspberry Pi, the BeagleBone, and then a large community of of people uh, uh, who will do stuff in their fab labs and and, and so on. So it's um, uh, yeah, we're getting there in terms of hardware. Um, and uh, yeah, in terms of, of software, maybe Marco, you want to you have you want to add more on on, on your vision? Sure. Um, I think uh, as we went back and in introducing the IoT projects and the large fragmentation when we need to deal with the different type of sensors, different type of low field protocols, uh, whether at the transport level or the application level, one of the big uh, inhibitor was actually the licensing of the open source for itself. Uh, putting together an IoT solution a lot of time implies uh, doing an assembling of different bits and pieces and the license of the different open source library and the complexity, I would say, of the open source licensing is that it should not be underestimated. So we definitely welcome initiatives like the Eclipse IoT Industry Working Group where by aggregating a lot of good projects and software under a single easy to understand license, we can actually easily uh, pick and choose the different parts of our IoT solutions and compose them together into a good successful product. Okay, great. Yeah. Uh, if I may add something here, I, I agree with Marco here that actually uh, there's free and free, I mean even inside of free, uh, the question of license is, 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 pretty, uh, is, is pretty difficult to actually um, decide. Um, um, we were talking with um, some guys from the ITF um, because we, we contribute there, and, and they were saying, you know, like if you don't have a BSD license, just forget it. You know, uh, your your stuff is not going to have any impact today. You know, and what what for example, like what what Linux pulled off a few years ago, you, no one is going to pull it off now. Uh, and so, are, are you guys BSD licensed? We're not actually. Okay. Okay. They were saying that to us, and so we're we're sticking to to some uh, LGPL license, and but but it it remains to be seen like what's what's the the best choice in the long term. Um, so um, actually, uh, it's it's so it's it's not just a question of like open source or not. Like um, even inside of open source, like how 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 open. And what what license is is really a crucial question that um, I think most people that start in 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 this in this field just don't know enough about. Yeah, there's always been lots of discussion even before IoT about um, what license what's the impact of license on on a community and getting contributions. Um, so I think um, certainly with within IoT there's there's certain things that need to be. Um, can learn again, and because certainly at the hardware level. 
Um, so actually, there's there's a question uh, for you, Manuel, pretty specific um, to to Riot. So um, I'll just read it. So um, is the co-op protocol implementation based on lib co-op, and the RPL is your own implementation? Yes, that's exactly the case. Uh, so for lib co-op, um, that was one of the good good side uh, that we wanted to demonstrate for Riot. Uh, you know, like we we took we took the the, the implementation from uh, the guys from. Uh, uh, Bremen, uh, University of Bremen, and uh, we just ported that, and, and it was really easy for us to do that. And then it's just like a, a module that we import. Um, and so, um, one thing we wanted to demonstrate here is that you know we we, we you know the, the base of Riot makes it really easy to integrate uh, these different pieces, just like um, and like Marco was talking about. Um, uh, but for the Ripple implementation, yes, we uh, we have our own uh, Ripple implementation, uh, and we actually also have another Ripple implementation that comes from the uh, from the OpenWSN um, network stack that's just been ported. So, um, but they, they implement different modes. Uh, so the Rip, the Ripple implementation from uh, from Riot um, actually has uh, the um, um, Hop by hop, um, the storing mode basically, and the OpenWSN has the non-storing mode. Okay. So um, again, if you have a question, um, please please feel free to to ask it. Um, one of the things I've been really curious about, um, we just had a panel on open hardware, um, and how do you guys see the open hardware community and the open source software community working together? And, and and how do we is it happening and and if it's not what do we need to do to make it happen? So we uh, just like one uh, one example. Um, we we were recently at Cibit and uh, we had a small small booth where we, we showed like a, um, a small application we developed for for Red and uh, uh, some guys uh, turned up and were really interested and and just said hey well actually um, you know we're from Udo. Uh, so they built like interesting um, open source hardware, and like uh, they uh, they built this uh, this nice uh, mix between uh, 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 Arduino Duo and uh, uh, four core A9, I think. Uh, so big big little architecture, and they said, "Hell, oh, well, actually, you know, just just." We, we got some hardware here. Just take it and and uh, and and play with it, please. And then then you know like uh, and and left. So usually in uh, in this type of type of events, you know, like you're used to go to booths to get some hardware or freebies, but they're like just sitting there. Uh, you know, we we got some free hardware, and we really we started playing with it. So uh, I think it's it's kind of like uh, yeah, there's there's a good relationship between uh, open source hot hardware and and these these. Uh, these, uh, these, uh, these hardware uh, um, developers. So, and um, yeah. And of course, I mean, we see, uh, and we've discussed that during the open hardware panel. We see, we see more and more people uh, um, uh, teaming up to do kickstarters uh, and build, uh, I mean, solutions where they. Uh, both work on the hardware and the software together. In terms of uh, of um, uh, open source community, I'm not sure we have yet the kind of the framework for uh, for putting the hardware guys together with the software guys. It's still very uh, very separate. Uh, the um, DIY kind of people who do Arduinos, Raspberry Pi kind of stuff, and uh, people who work um, up the stack in the in the protocol layers, the frameworks and stuff. So um, yeah, maybe we will see more and more um, uh, yeah ki kickstarters, and, and and at some point maybe uh, we will start getting uh, I mean projects like like uh, Riot OS. I don't know Emmanuel if if you ever um, uh, thought about joining um, an, a larger um, uh, hardware or software community uh, as in open source community to make maybe reach more um, uh, yeah more software or hardware people. Oh yeah, I mean, we 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 would be interested in in uh, co more collaborations. Uh, so we uh, we regularly discuss these kind of things, and um, uh, so I, I I think we 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 uh, we could gain uh, from uh, from from interacting with a larger community, such as a crypto for for example, uh, and. Um, 
yeah, so though this this type of uh, interaction, I think, is is what will you know uh, make the Internet uh, of Things actually a reality when 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 things start to kind of crystallize together. Uh, so yeah. I think this type of inter interaction is is you know uh, is is wanted. Um, so that's what kind of what I was I was mentioning about like uh, you know this kind of software big bang. Uh, so we were more on the software uh, uh, side, but um, uh, so that's why I, I talk with this perspective. But where you're going to have some crystallization around some some dominant platforms, and uh, and then people on top will be able to uh, uh, you know develop these applications uh, much more easily. Yeah, for sure. So um, just going back to to the Q and A. Um, uh, this is actually targeted at you, Emmanuel. Are there some real life working deployments of Riot, of Riot networks? Emmanuel, you're on mute. Yeah, yeah, I was on mute. <laughs> so, <laughs> you're, a pop, you're a popular guy here, so so you're going to be doing lots of talking. Yeah, well, uh, so not not that we know of. Um, uh, so, so, so what, what, can you maybe um, could you just talk about about kind of where you're at and your, like kind of how long has the project been about um, been around and and what's what's next in terms of of how people can use use Riot OS? Yeah, so um, uh, there are two two ways to tell this story, but like the the the, the community open source community around around Riot is is pretty young. It's like Year and a half, um, year uh, old, so it's it's pretty new. Um, but um, the some of the basic building blocks of, of Red, so for example, like it's 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 uh, uh, micro kernel, it's it's much older. Uh, so it started like uh, uh, four years ago or something like that. So um, uh, what has clicked is a community of guys working on uh, the network stack. Uh, plus the guys that were working on the on the on the kernel uh, that got together and started to think, okay, you know, like uh, what we need for the IoT, and it seems like you know we could we could build something together, uh, so so that um, you know application developers could come on top of that and just like, hey, you know, like if I know Linux, uh, uh, then I, I I'm gonna have a very very minimal learning curve to be able to develop uh, things on 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 these on these IoT devices. That was our goal, and that's that's where I think we're 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 at this point now, where um, there is uh, 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 some still some development in the in the um, going on in the network stack, but that's gonna go on for a while because uh, just just for the reason that, for example, like some of the standards are are, are not yet totally mature. For example, at the ATF, there are a lot of drafts that are out there that uh, we think are gonna be very useful and successful RFCs in the future. But there's there's there are still not RFCs, so uh, we're we're gonna have like some uh, development going on in the network stack, for example. But the kernel is very is very uh, stable, has been stable for for a couple of years now. So um, this is gonna I don't I don't expect a lot of movement there, except for a very very precise uh, reasons. And so the the main the main um, the main growth areas uh, where we, we need help and, and more uh, people getting involved is at, at the very top above co-app, for example, at the application layer, like what to develop here in terms of modules to interact with various um, IoT cloud uh, platforms and uh, some work below uh, at the hardware abstraction layer. Uh, to port to new devices. Uh, that's 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 where like uh, the natural growth uh, is is going to happen. Uh, so I don't know if I answered all your question, but <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no, I think you did. So I, th I think um, I think the original question was really about talking about real real life deployments, and it sounds like you're you're not there yet, um, but you're you're it's you're you're ready to to get to that stage. Yeah. So uh, the the closest we got here is like um, on uh, these test beds I was talking about, where right. you have um, various test beds in France and in Germany that we uh, have contributed uh, building actually ourselves, where uh, you have uh, networks of hundreds of uh, IoT devices that actually run Riot. So I wouldn't call that uh, a real life deployment because they're test bits. Um, but they're, 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 they're as close as you can get uh, before a deployment phase, uh, and that's that's intended like that. I mean, to be a tool so that you know, like when you deploy your stuff, you 
you're, you're, <laughs> you can yeah. like debug. So, but no, we, we do not know of any live uh, deployment yet. Okay. Okay, um, so we're coming to the end of our time, but so just one comment I'll read. Um, uh, it's not really a question, but well, maybe I guess it could be. So basically, there's a comment. It would be cool if um, some video tutorial to improve documentation on how to compile Riot um, for a microcontroller. Um, so is there any plan for that? Yeah, so we're uh, you know we're working a lot on on the documentation right now. Uh, so we have um, a release that is planned um, at the end of this month that is uh, uh, focusing on documentation, and uh, we're currently compiling a, a bunch of uh, slides and uh, crash course. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So that that you know, like uh, I'm right with the, this. Whoever asked this question or this comment, uh, I think this is a, a very important step right now. I mean, uh, if you have a really good software, uh, but bad documentation is just like not gonna cut it. Um, so uh, documentation is always a, a key, and it's always a challenge to get good it, stuff. It, it, so we we're very aware of that, and uh, so we are uh, we are working actively on that, and we, we know we're lagging a little bit behind, but we're we're confident with the, that with the next release, which is focusing exactly on that, not on adding new feature, uh, will will uh, really improve on that. So so I think one one final question, and it's for you, Manuel. So um, what's the best basic hardware platform to start playing with Riot? That's a that's a good question because we we uh, we uh, we we were asked many times. Okay, what's your uh, what's your uh, it's a reference hardware and yeah, other than yeah. we we uh, we don't really have one. So um, what we based ourselves on was um, the hardware that was on these test beds uh, that we uh, have contributed uh, building, but they're not they're not really so so available hardware. Uh, but there's this company that was built off, um, uh, so it's a spin-off of Inria that has, uh, that's called Hikobe, uh, that uh, actually has built some of the hardware on one of these um, uh, test beds, and they have a commercial version of that. Uh, so the Hikobe Fox, for example, uh, board is, is uh, one thing we could recommend. Uh, it's in my slides, you can, you can see the reference there. But we but we, we don't really have a reference. Uh, Are you going to work towards one or? Sorry. Are, will you work towards one? Yes. Uh, so um, one thing I mean we, we really like for example the Arduino uh, board so the Arduino Due for example could be one but the thing is it doesn't have a radio so uh, we you know like there's one one thing we, one of the reasons why we don't have a reference uh, hardware is like there's there are always like some really cool aspects to these uh, to these devices, but there's always one thing missing. So, I mean, my my dream uh, my dream uh, IT hardware would have like you know Bluetooth and uh, 18, uh, 802.15.4 uh, radio uh, and you know Core XM3 or something like that. Um, so uh, I haven't seen any 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 hardware like this, and I, I'm I'm pretty confident that something will pop up soon that where we see okay that's our reference hardware because you know that's what we want. But uh, that's one of the aspects why we we don't have reference hardware here. But I, I understand this is this is uh, this is uh, this is something we have to uh, to address. Uh, sure. Also the price. Also I mean you don't want to have a hard reference hardware. It's going to be too expensive. Uh, you know, so uh, yeah, like the Arduino price point is is pretty compelling. So. Yeah. <laughs> so, all right. Well, I, I think that's that's the end of our our, our panel. Um, thank you, uh, Marco and Benjamin and Manuel. Um, it was uh, very interesting. Um, thank you everyone for for attending and the, and the questions.